one expanded to include family members, as well as service members and veterans living in the surrounding states and counties who work and study here within New York City, making our regional veteran military and family community one of the top three metropolitan populations in the nation. Our veterans span diverse backgrounds in terms of age, race, military service branches and components, which include active National Guard and reserves, deployment and combat experience, as well as generations of service. Thus, it is vitally important to embrace the needs and strengths of our entire community, supporting and empowering their ability to apply their skills and diverse range of experience as they continue to serve on behalf of others. Achieving this goal requires extensive outreach to engage individuals and family members, connecting them with quality care, resources and services that enable them to grow and prosper personally and professionally. To this end, we know that navigating the myriad agencies, providers and associated reg reg regulations and processes can, can really represent one of the biggest challenges for veterans and family members. At DVS, we strive to take the frustrations, the hassles, the trial and error out of navigation from outreach and employment assistance to facilitating peer mentoring and whole health services to veteran homelessness reduction. DVS staff members work with veterans one-on-one -on -one to help them figure out what benefits they might be eligible for and how to best get access to quality vetted services. In relation to today's hearing, I would like to discuss some of the ways DVS can connect veterans and families in need of mental health services with the resources they need to heal their wounds, illnesses, and injuries, restore meaning and purpose through peer and social support, and to strengthen their capacity for continued service. Starting with our line of action, whole health and community resilience. Through DVS's whole health and community resilience line of action, led by Assistant Commissioner Darlene Brown-Williams, PhD, our city matches veterans and their families with opportunities to connect, to heal, to grow, and to thrive. As part of the pioneering Thrive NYC Mental Health Initiative, pioneered by First Lady of New York City, Shirlane McRae, DVS has successfully implemented the Vets Thrive NYC Whole Health and Community Resilience Program, comprised of two parts. First, the Whole Health and Community Resilience Outreach Team, and secondly, the Core 4 Whole Health Model. Year one goal of Vets Thrive NYC was to engage 2,000 veterans and their families, improving their lives by enhancing access to a comprehensive range of services specifically tailored to their needs and strengths. Vets Thrive NYC focuses on a coordinated integration of clinical and holistic services, including the identification of mental health symptoms as well as overall mental wellness aimed at addressing the full impact of war and military service on the mind, body, and spirit. DVS's core four whole health model shifts the conversation to, converse, to concentrate on what matters most to veterans and their families regarding the many areas of life that can affect their health and well-being. It is designed to foster hope, healing, and wholeness through informed access to clinical treatment, community holistic services, peer, family, and community social support, and cultural initiatives and the arts. Thus far, Whole Health and Community Resilience has exceeded its year one goal by engaging over 7,000 New York City veterans, their families, and constituents across the city through various initiatives designed to increase social engagement and help-seeking behaviors through the context of a peer-based support model. Grounded in the guiding principles of the Thrive NYC Mental Health Initiative, the Whole Health and Community Resilience Team's multi-pronged outreach approach and core four whole health model programs are designed to engage the full scope of our veterans and their families' lives. Starting with guiding principle number one, changing the culture. Whole Health focuses on changing the culture by encouraging individuals to have an open conversation about mental health. Mental health first aid training focuses on increasing awareness of mental health concerns and connection to services through education. DVS has successfully certified six members of its Whole Health team as mental health first aid instructors and has trained 165 members of the New York City community in either adult or veteran and military family mental health first aid training. 
Throughout the remainder of this year, DVS has several upcoming trainings scheduled with the VA Vet Center staff, New York City elected officials, community partners, facilities, and administrators at New York City colleges and universities, and the veterans community at large. Guiding principle number two, close treatment gaps. This year, DVS completed the integration of the New York City 311 information systems and the VA crisis hotline, which ensures that veterans and their families act early to address mental health challenges and that families are aware of and connected to available resources and mental health services. In conjunction with New York City 311, DVS has ensured the connection of 187 veterans to mental health services at the VA crisis hotline and connected over 400 individuals to mental health services through NYC Well and an array of comprehensive mental and physical health service providers. Guiding principle number three, partnering with communities. Engagement in cultural experiences and the arts represents a timeless connection to our shared humanity acting as a healing balm to ease the human suffering of mind, body, and spirit. Through the Core 4 Whole Health Model Outreach, the Whole Health team ensures that veterans and their families are connected to creative writing programs, community art workshops, musical and theater groups, storytelling experiences, and other arts-based and cultural events to help facilitate the healing process and launch their human journey towards wholeness. DVS's Theater of War project, led by public artist and residents Brian Dorries, is a two-year collaborative project with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the Brooklyn Public Library. This year, the project has completed 24 performances and engaged over 2,500 individuals through stage readings of ancient Greek plays that serve as a catalyst for town hall discussions about the challenges faced by service members, veterans, their caregivers, and families. I would just add to the chairs, I've got a copy of this, this month's Smithsonian Journal that features Brian Dory's work, including his public artist and residency. I'll make sure that every member of the uh, city council uh, committees gets the link as well as a hard copy. DVS and Brian Dory's continue to reach out to arts and community organizations in the spirit of collaboration. For instance, in the spring of 2017, DVS hosted a veteran artist roundtable discussion with representatives from the Exit 12 Dance Company, Arts in the Armed Forces, Society of Artistic Veterans, Warrior Writers, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, Poetic Theater Productions, and Bedlam. Our DVS lead for our public artist in residency and the whole health culture, education, and arts domain. Monique Rada is with us today and is constantly reaching out to interested organizations to explore the potential for collaboration and we welcome any suggestions for community organizations, veteran service organizations, or other agencies who would be interested in working with us. Another DVS partnership initiative pertains to the more than 5.5 military and veteran caregivers in the United States. As a member of the Senator Elizabeth Dole Foundation's Hidden Heroes Initiative, our whole health team has ensured that New York City's military and veteran caregivers are aware of and connected to comprehensive mental health services tailored to their needs. This year, DVS successfully hosted an event and engaged over 60 such military and veterans caregivers to ensure that those serving in the shadows receive the assistance they deserve. More programming will follow during this next year to reach this most worthy and all too often hidden population. Because of the tremendous work of our whole health team, we are proud at DVS that the Elizabeth Dole Foundation has recently announced that New York City is leading the way as a model hidden hero city. Number four, act early. Through the whole health team's public facing outreach efforts, community forums, and speaking engagements, we've engaged with over 4,500 individuals this year. The whole health team conducts weekly multi-pronged outreach in satellite offices at the VA vet centers, New York City borough president offices, student veterans at college and universities, and other community and faith-based organizations faith-based organizations specific to veterans across the city. This direct connection with veterans and their families has increased our visibility and enhanced our ability to help individuals act early 
by providing veterans and their families with equal access to care that works for them when and where they need it. Number five, use data better. Through a collaboration with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, known as SAMHSA, the whole health team hosted a virtual implementation academy on advancing suicide prevention best practices in peer support for service members, veterans, and their families. During this conference, DVS convened 25 mental health service providers in a conversation on peer-based suicide prevention efforts and methods to enhance collaboration and the use of data and technical assistance from SAMHSA in New York City. As a part of this process, SAMHSA's Service Member Veteran and Family Technical Assistance Center committed to helping New York City track our outcomes related to the vital role peers can play in preventing suicide. Moving to our next line of action, housing and support services. The department has been dedicated to effectively ending veteran homelessness in New York City. As many of you know, we have been certified by the federal government as effectively ending chronic veteran homelessness and as a community has reduced veteran homelessness by 90% since its peak in 2001. Much of this can be attributed to the city's additional housing, financial assistance, and innovation, innovative housing assistance models led by Assistant Commissioner and Senior Advisor Nicole Branca here with us today, as well as the ongoing resources from Washington, D.C. However, it's also been about ensuring that those whom we house actually stay housed. For many veterans, an affordable apartment and rental assistance is all that they need. For others, housing stability depends upon also receiving mental health and other support services. To this end, DVS has spearheaded an interagency aftercare working group to share best practices, identify gaps in care, and advocate for the programs and policies to fill these gaps. As a result of the work of this group, the Robin Hood Foundation has recently funded a pilot program to provide clinical care to veterans who are exiting shelter for permanent housing. The pilot program administered through Help USA is based on the evidence-based critical time intervention model with clinicians providing intensive clinical support in the short term, followed by connections to community-based care in the long term. DVS also continues to work with its city partners to ensure that there's a sufficient supply of supportive housing available to veterans diagnosed with serious mental illness and substance use disorders. Moving on to our third line of action, led by Jamal Othman to my left, uh, who serves as our Assistant Commissioner for CE5, that's City Employment, Education, Entrepreneurship, <coughs> Engagement, and Events. In 2017, DVS established a citywide presence with satellite sites in each of the five boroughs. The department's com community outreach specialists are trained to connect veterans and their families to trusted resources available to them from the city, state, and federal governments, as well as a myriad of local, private, and not-for-profit resources. In this way, DVS has helped veterans one-on-one -on -one to navigate and apply for benefits, such as the GI Bill, New York State tuition, veteran property tax exemptions, and local housing support. When veterans contact DVS with mental health concerns, they are connected internally with our whole health team, institutional partners such as the Steve A. Cohen Family Clinic at NYU Langone, their local vet center, NYC Well, or the, vet, the VA crisis hotline. The department is currently in the beta phase of implementing a Microsoft Dynamics customer relationship management platform, which allows for a unified system of intake and tracking veterans who request assistance from our agency across all three lines of action. DBS staff has participated in trainings and design workshops to target what information is necessary to capture in order to assist veterans with a wide range of needs and requests. Full rollout with additional capabilities will deploy in the coming weeks. DBS also works through the provisions of Local Law 42 from 2013 to promote interagency understanding of the mental health needs of veterans by providing training to city agency veteran liaisons. 
This year, DVS provided annual training on veteran mental health first aid, which helps liaisons identify individuals who may be experiencing mental health challenges and to assist in connecting them with service providers. Moving on now to veterans in the criminal justice system. DVS is actively building on the pioneering work led by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and its Task Force on Behavioral Health and the Criminal Justice System. And are working with our partners in the Veterans Administration, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, New York City Department of Correction, Thrive NYC, and legal service organizations as to how we may stem the flow of veterans entering the criminal justice system, promote successful at access to services while incarcerated and promote successful re-entry into the community. New York City has taken a bold step in evaluating the needs of veterans involved in the criminal justice system by creating a veterans only housing unit at Rikers Island, soon to become fully operational, where veterans who have served can commune with each other in an environment which fosters hope and camaraderie through shared experiences. DVS continues to work with the Department of Correction, MOCJ, and Veterans Advocates to promote self-identification, access to legal services, educational programming, and performance evaluation for both veteran inmates and Rikers staff. As we continue to engage with our stakeholder agencies, nonprofit partners, and advocates, we also look forward to identifying ways to effectively connect veterans with providers who have the capacity to deliver timely legal services as well as how we can minimize our veterans' contact with the criminal justice system in the first place. <laughs> Lastly, public-private partnerships. We have seen the invaluable benefit of mentoring programs across the state with the private first class Joseph P. Dwyer Veteran Peer Support Program and the five veteran treatment courts in each respective borough in New York City. In the coming months, DVS will launch, in fact, has launched a mentoring initiative which brings together 25 different service providers in an effort to collectively identify and address the peer-to-peer -peer needs of veterans and their families. It is important that veterans seeking to fulfill their next mission in New York City as students understand the options available to them when facing the rigors of higher education. To this end, as part of the Veterans on Campus initiative, DVS is in the first phase of conducting a listening tour of the 40 colleges and universities with the highest populations of student veterans in New York City to brainstorm and implement best practices on helping these students succeed. We are seeking to capture feedback from student veterans about their transition experience and adjustment to academic life and encourage school leadership to continue their further robust efforts that support student veterans and their families, such as improving ease of access for student veterans to mental health resources they need to excel inside and outside of the classroom. In conclusion, <coughs> DVS looks forward to a robust future dedicated to improving the lives of New York City veterans and their families. Core to our mission is the belief that veterans and their families are our city's leading natural resource. And their strength and demonstrated commitment to public service will help New York City thrive. As our department continues to grow in vision, scope, and capacity, we will build the strongest foundation possible for connecting veterans and their families with high quality services across a variety of needs, all of this is driven towards empowering our veterans' capacity for and commitment to continued service within our city as great neighbors, community volunteers, civic leaders, employees, business owners, and families. The work of serving those who have served our country in uniform must be a team effort. Indeed, we cannot neglect to thank our educational, community, and institutional partners, such as the Teachers College at Columbia University, Headstrong Project, one of our community leads for the Core 4 initiative, Mental Health America, the New York City Veterans Mental Health Coalition, also one of our community leads for the Core 4 model, Brooklyn Public Library, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, our VA partners, including New York City Vet Centers, NYC Well, a key initiative of the Thrive Program that is accessible 
any time of day linking anyone in New York City, including our veterans and their family members, with trained mental health counselors who can link them directly to services. We are also partnering with the David Lynch Foundation ProVetus, which is our peer-based uh, uh, community lead for our core four uh, whole health model, as well as, of course, our colleagues at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Vets Thrive NYC Consortium, and our core four whole health steering group, Veterans Advisory Board, nonprofit and private private sector partners, our veteran services and advocacy community, and the countless service providers we work with daily, all year long, continuing to support our veterans and their families. Truly, we are all in this together. Finally, I'd like to thank our colleagues in the New York City Council, Chair Ulrich, Chair Cohen, members of your respective committees, for your past and continued support in pushing the needs of our veterans and their families forward in New York City. Thank you again for this opportunity to meet with you today. At this time, I would be happy to address your questions and engage your ideas. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I first want to apologize for being late. I took the A train today. <laughs> uh, I waited 20 minutes for the train to arrive on a freezing platform. And then once underground, it went local, not express. So um, I want to apologize. I did get a chance to review your testimony, the parts that I missed. I want to thank you and your team for the extraordinary job that you're doing in the, in the areas of mental health. This is a, as you know, uh, Commissioner, this is a very uh, troubling time of year for veterans. The holidays can be very tough uh, with the depression and other mental health issues that some of them may suffer from. So this conversation, I, I think, is very important. But I'm just, you know, marveling at, at the uh, network of uh, public-private partnerships that you've been able to establish in the short time uh, that uh, the department has been up and running and, and getting the word out and helping veterans get access to mental health services, quality mental health services, I, I just think is such an important issue. And you and your team are, are, are just doing a, a great job. And I want to thank the First Lady, of course, the Mayor's uh, wife, for, for really leading the charge on this issue as well. It's important to all New Yorkers, but in particular to those who have served our country. I think we owe it to them to make sure that they get the help that they need. So I'm going to forego my opening statement. And uh, I know that some of our colleagues have questions, including the Chair. And I want to thank the Chair, uh, Andy Cohen, who does a phenomenal job with this committee. Very, very important issue. We can't do enough to help our veterans. And uh, Andy, thank you for agreeing to, to co-chair the hearing today. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Crowley. Uh, I was remiss in acknowledging the staff, uh, Sylvester Yavana, Michael Benjamin, Jan Jeanette Merrill, and my Legislative Council, Kate Theobald. Um, I am curious. Uh, one, let me just say, you know, I'm, I'm I'm a very big fan of yours. If you decide after this hearing you want to go in Dade, New Jersey, I will follow because uh, <laughs> I just have tremendous <laughs> confidence in your leadership, and I think that you've been a, a real partner. Um, uh, you uh, in your in your testimony, you you state that there's 211,000 veterans in New York City. Is is that number provided by the the Census Bureau? Where do we get that? In fact, actually, our own Venkat Matapoli, who is our uh, chief information officer, he uh, did, we'll just grab this in a moment, but what he did, he did the analytics uh, bringing together the Veterans Administration data, the census data, uh, DOD data, and this is the first ever really uh, accurate. the most accurate uh, estimate of our veterans in New York City that also includes a by bureau, by borough uh, numbering of them. So um, here's, here's, uh, by borough was my it, second question. By so. borough. So we, <laughs> we will provide that information for you. I will tell you, it's very interesting to, to look at this data and to understand that, um, for example, uh, as we look at the borough by borough data, uh, we're looking at we're looking at Queens with 27.9 percent, uh, a little over nearly 59,000 veterans in Brooklyn, 25.7, a little over 54,000 Manhattan, 18.3 percent, over 38,000 the Bronx, 
17.9 percent, 37,495, as well as Staten Island, 10.2 uh, percent of our veteran population, over 21,502 veterans. We also know that the per capita population in Staten Island is larger than uh, any of the other boroughs, but we, we we're so excited about this information that really has allowed us to dig down, and I, I have to I have to just give a little plug for uh, Venkat because um, he was recently uh, recognized as one of seven city agencies out of 135 agencies that received a best of New York City uh, data analytics and innovation award for his work precisely in doing this. Best of all, this is just the beginning, but we've got the right data analytics smarts to really help us dig down and know, uh, you know who our population is. And I think I mentioned in my remarks that we know it's not just the five boroughs. As I'm telling our student veteran leaders and college and university presidents on this listening tour, uh, you know, if you're a student veteran who commutes in and works or goes to school here in New York City, you're our veterans too and of course families. So this is just a start, but we are very excited to, uh, uh, to be able to show the diversity, the ubiquity of veterans in our New York City neighborhoods and to de-aggregate this by income, era of service, age, race, education, and employment. On our website, you can actually see the, um, uh, the, the charts that really in a very punchy, uh, 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 engaging way tell this story. Well, I, I think that's great because, I mean, obviously, as a as a predicate matter, we have to know who these people are if we're gonna if we're gonna uh, uh, serve them. Um, do you know how many of of the two hundred eleven thousand have contact with your department, or have had contact with your department? Yeah. So I I mentioned the in terms of our whole health. This is what we prepared for for this hearing. So over seven thousand we have connected with in our outreach team, of whom several thousand, then we have actually, not several thousand, several hundred of which we have connected with services. So the, the, the effort here is through our, um, our whole health and our outreach team, which actually spans not just our whole health and community resilience team, but also it spans our housing and support services, our veteran peer counselors, as well as Jamal's uh, community outreach specialist. So it's really a holistic approach. As we, as I mentioned, as we bring our beta system, this customer relationship management system, into full operation, we will increasingly be able to have a real-time ability to identify how many veterans we're connecting with, how many, how many we're engaging with, how many we are connecting uh, to services. So we're not quite there yet, but a, a key, and I, I just, I'm looking at uh, Council Member Valone now, who's been such a, uh, champion for uh, our efforts to get greater data clarity on this issue. Um, I will say that uh, we're very excited that this coming, uh, this coming spring, in addition to the data that's gained through Local Law 23, the Mayor's Office of Operations is working with us on a citywide identification form where a veteran's self-identifiable question will be made available. It will launch in early 2018. We will keep you posted because this is the first step as Council Member Vallone and, and we have talked about for these last couple of years. It's the first step to knowing who of our veteran population, our military and our families where have they connected with our city services and how can we then know to follow up, regardless of where they've connected so that we can get our arms around them and make sure that we've give the, given them really a, a comprehensive approach. So it's a journey, we're on it. Uh, uh, it says here, let me just make sure that I, I get this correct, we do have some specific data in addition to the nearly 8,000 veterans reached through our community uh, uh, whole health and community resilience line of action. Uh, through CE5, Jamal's line of action, DVS has participated in over 300 community outreach events, provided one-on-one -on -one assistance to over 2,900 veterans and family members between March 26th and September 2017, helping them to navigate and apply for benefits such as the GI Bill, New York State tuition, veteran property tax exemptions, including the new school tax exemption and local housing support. 
Further, there, we have made 154 successful referrals to coordinated services via the New York Ser Serves Coordinated Service Network, soon to be rebranded uh, following the completion of procurement to Vet Connect NYC. So we are very excited. We are all over this, uh, this quest to get greater data granularity of who we serve and how they are seeking services. This is what we know at this point, more to follow. No, I, I appreciate that, but obviously like you could be doing a great job or we could be missing a, a, lot, a, a tremendous amount of the population. We, we're not clear on that, so that would be helpful Absolutely. surveying them. In, in terms of like, can you extrapolate from sort of national populations like you know, how, how many, I mean, I, I think that, it, you know, anecdotally, or at least my understanding that you know, most veterans come back and they're well integrated into society and uh, I think they're more successful than average, but people obviously, there's also a, a real identifiable population that has, comes back with real issues or comes, you, you know, is or, or poorly reintegrated. Uh, from a national perspective, whether it's uh, uh, addiction or uh, uh, post-traumatic stress or do we have a sense sort of nationally, like if it, based on national trends, how many people are living in New York City with those, with those challenges? So we do. Uh, the national uh, numbers will tell us that by generation of veteran, approximately 20% or so with the uh, post 9-11 veterans and our Gulf War, first Gulf War era veterans, we know that uh, about 20% of them experience a diagnostic threshold level of either post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, anxiety disorders, or depression. I think we've got a ways to go in terms of getting the substance uh, use disorders included in that. I have not seen generation-specific numbers. We know that for our, vet our Vietnam veteran population that it's closer to 30% with that combination of PTSD, uh, uh, anxiety, or depression. I want to just stop here for a moment, though, and just say that, um, you know, someone could say, well, that's a lot of veterans, and it is a lot of veterans, but we can't just limit our efforts to the 20 to 30 percent who may be experiencing at a diagnostic threshold. That's why 40 percent of our department is in the field, in the community, every day, all day, throughout the week, because we know the importance of reaching our entire population, because we know you know, the sooner we can intervene, uh, congruent with the First Lady's uh, Thrive in NYC guiding principles, the more effective we can be in preventing someone who may have post-traumatic stress symptoms, which is very, very common, but if we can intervene early, we can keep that from progressing to PTSD. So we know that um, uh, to extrapolate the uh, national numbers to New York City, these numbers equate to roughly, of our post 9-11 veterans, roughly in the range of 2,500 to 4,600 veterans uh, who may have a diagnostic level of PTSD, anxiety, or depression, including uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. We also know that for Desert Storm, that's uh, sort of the early 90s generation of veteran, roughly 2,700 uh, Veterans uh, uh, living in New York City may be experiencing issues related to their service in this respect. And then our Vietnam uh, veteran brothers and sisters, uh, a little over 18,000. So clearly, uh, we're not limiting ourselves to just reaching these folks. We're taking a population approach, and that's the beauty of leading through as our core four whole health model demonstrates that we're leading through a strength-based foundation of grit. Our version is growth, resilience, integrity, and teamwork. That's why we've brought on a public artist in residence whose work is renowned and through whose investment we can make a very bold statement about the role of culture and the arts. That it is not just fluff, it is not a luxury to be reserved for the affluent or a fortunate you, but rather it is life, it is connection to our shared humanity. In a place like New York City, we are building on that initial investment to build out our entire citywide uh, uh, consortium of culture, education, the arts. C2, our connection, our peer-to-peer -peer connection. 
vitally important. This is the optimal point of entry into this core four whole health model. This is a nonlinear, dynamic model. If we first encounter you and you are actively suicidal, we will not refer you to a theater of war or a writing program. You will go straight to C4, which is clinical treatment. Our community lead for community treatment for clinical treatment is the Headstrong Project, working across the city with other clinical programs, such as the NYU Langone uh, Medical Center Clinic, as well as our VA colleagues. C3, our community holistic services, this we have identified as the biggest gap, gap in knowledge, gap in knowledge among our service providers. Uh, we've got Joe Hunt here who represents the MHA, New York City Veterans Mental Health Coalition, over 900 service providers who work with veterans and their families here in New York City. But we know that many of those service providers don't know about, you know, what is it really like to experience equine therapy? And why might you think that, you know, working with a horse when you're not even riding the horse might actually be stabilizing and may actually restore trusting, safe relationships? Well, it turns out there's a really pretty good reason that that works, but we want to get out to our service providers first to help them understand the role of things like not only equine therapy, service dog therapy, which many of our veterans and family members point to as the number one mental health intervention that has saved and restored their family life. We also know that as we move forward, not only reaching out to our service providers, but we want to be able to reach out to our military service members, veterans, and families. This is why in the new year we will be uh, issuing an RFP so that we can really get a head start on bridging this gap within the context of the core four whole health model. You will be hearing more about this going forward, but I would just, I would just take a moment to say, 10 years ago when I was still in, in uniform, 2007, it was a wretched period. Uh, Walter Reed, the scandal there that was exposed by the Washington Post had, had torn our army asunder. We lost the secretary of the army, the surgeon general, the commander at Walter Reed. I was summoned from my, uh, uh, my downrange deployment to serve as the command surgeon in Iraq and was instead assigned to Washington, D.C. We knew we were years behind with the kinds of brain injuries, whether it be traumatic, whether it be explosive, whether it be direct uh, contact, we knew that we were years behind. At that time, as I reached out to what I call our early, early warning system, those are our veteran center counselors, many of whom hailed from the Vietnam era, thought they had seen everything. And as I reached out and said, what are you all seeing? Tell me, because we've got to make up time. They said, you know, ma'am, we don't know. We thought we had seen everything, but whatever it is that these young men and women are coming back with, it's the toughest thing we've ever seen. Well, we looked at that, and we did some research, and we dug into it to think, well, why could this be so? We had people at the time who were approaching us and say, oh, aren't you all just coddling this generation of veterans? After all, our World War II veterans, they went, they were gone for the duration. We thought, you know, let's not lead with that. Let's lead with what is their, how does their experience differ? When we looked at the one factor that has emerged both in Department of Defense and VA internal research, as well as now validated by external academic research teams, days of combat exposure, days of exposure to fear, threat, trauma, and loss. By that measure, you look back to World War I, going through to our post-9-11 veterans of today, days of exposure really has, has, has varied from about 100 days of exposure, World War I, up through Vietnam, about 300 on, on average. Most of our Vietnam veterans who deployed uh, to Vietnam were there for one year. When you look at the 34-year-old who perhaps was in high school here in New York City on 9-11 and who, knowing we were going to war, raised his or her hand and said, here I am, send me, that young man or woman, now 34, if he or she has stayed in the military during these years, they have experienced 
500, 1,000, 1,500 or more days of exposure to threat, fear, loss, and combat. Successive, repetitive, relentless deployments. So that is why we reached out 10 years ago. We invested in these kinds of community holistic services. DOD was laughed at. People scorned us. They thought we had lost our ever-living minds by investing in these kinds of things. Well, I would say for any of you who are interested in change, you know, leading change, it's a great story because 10 years later, we can see that our culture as a whole has broadly embraced these modalities and it's been led the way by veterans and their families and now service members and communities. But what we lack now coming back to revisit this unfinished work as I assumed the duties of commissioner three years ago, we didn't have a model. Because of our early investments, we now know enough about what works, but we didn't have a model. So this, the core for whole health model, is our model, which when I was first briefing this to the good Dr. Belkin in our old hellhole office, you remember that, don't you, at uh, Broadway and Leonard? Always thrilled to go there. Always thrilled. <laughs> And it started out on a napkin. It was on a back piece of paper. I think by the time you saw it, Gary, it was up on that uh, crummy old scrappy whiteboard. Dr. Belkin went up there and said, all of this is great, Commissioner, but one thing. And he scratched out the word veteran. You'll see that on the whole health model, veteran is not listed. Dr. Belkin said, this isn't limited to veterans. You all are going to, you know, you're going to validate and get proof of concept, but this is a human model of whole health. That's the road that we're on. That's why the White House and SAMHSA reached out to us two years ago so that we could introduce this model. And we are so excited to be, as we are in year two of our, our new uh, agency here in New York City, doing what no other city has yet done, thanks to the leadership of the council and of our great service providers, advocates, and yes, team members of DBS. Could you just raise your hand so we can just recognize you all? We are really, really blessed, so thank you so much. I realize, Chair Cohen, that that was a lengthy answer to a very simple question, but it's important that people know where we've come from and where we are. This is a journey, not a destination. Even I'm not sure what I asked, Richard. <laughs> uh, but but, but uh, dovetailing that, I'm curious if you have a sense of, uh, uh, of the VA services in the city are New York City veterans being effectively served by the VA? I'm, I'm not saying that you're in a position to. Uh, I am in a position, uh, actually. I get my, my health care both from the Manhattan and the Brooklyn, care VA, the Brooklyn VA, including mental health services. When I call in for an appointment, they don't know I'm commissioner. I get access. We know that access is one thing, but eligibility is a whole other thing. And we know that you know, the importance of having a broad, robust community effort is roughly about half of our veterans uh, are even eligible or choose to use VA services. But it's another reason why we're so excited about what's currently working today, the NY Serves model, which the city has procured, is procuring as our lead initial investment. This is the investment that demonstrates that the change from MOBA, the Ma Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, to DVS, the Department of Veterans Services, is much, much more than a change in name only. And the VA, including all six of our New York City vet centers, has been a member of this coordinated service network from day one. Three weeks ago, we had the secretary of the VA, Secretary Shulkin, who was here and in, in, engaged our community and heard our questions, heard our concerns. Uh, I will tell you, the VA uh, has been extremely receptive. They've been a partner. They are an essential partner. We make them better, and they make us better. You will never see us talk about the VA in any way other than as an essential partner making each other better. When it comes to mental health services here in New York City, because there is such an incredible wealth of mental health services in New York City, actually the VA campus through Martina Peruta and uh, uh, Eric uh, Longhoff in the Bronx, they're able to offer our services in a telemental health model that will reach communities in Ohio or in Idaho or other places where they're just not to be had. This combined with our private partners, and I know I was just talking uh, to Miguel, uh, Headstrong Project is 
broadening out mental health, uh, telemental health services. I know that the Langone Clinic has been doing this for the last two years, supported in part by the contributions of the city council. We are blessed here in New York. So I think that what we have to do is we have to, uh, oh, this is great. Yeah, we've got a little more information as well. We've got to get the information out. So for example, in August of this year, the DOD issued a memorandum instructing the Army Review Board's agency. This is the office that's charged with changing military records to give, quote, liberal consideration to veterans looking to upgrade their less than honorable discharges or, quote, bad paper because of mental health conditions or traumatic brain injury, sexual assault, or sexual harassment, and outlines what should be considered when deciding an upgrade. The GAO replaced released a report in May stating that more than 13,000 service members suffering from PTSD, TBI, or adjustment, anxiety, bipolar, and substance use disorders were separated from the military for misconduct from 2011 to 2015. We know that, we don't know exactly what proportion, but we know that a number of those veterans have come to New York City. When you add in members of our LGBTQ community, many of whom, including myself, have come to New York City as a place where we can find community, where we can find a purpose, where we can feel safe, where we can belong. We know that we have our work to do in reaching out and making sure that folks know of this new development. Additionally, in July of this year, the VA, through Secretary Shulkin's leadership, began allowing those with less than honorable discharges up to 90 days of residential inpatient or outpatient treatment at VA medical centers for crisis intervention if they are exhibiting risk factors of suicide related to their service. Patients who need inpatient or residential treatment can be treated at Perry Point or Balt Baltimore, but this is a huge new effort that allows us, no matter what your paper is, your discharge status, we can bring you into our local VA facilities today, sort it out if there's a chance that you were one of these who were wrongly discharged for misconduct when in fact you had a brain injury uh, that was related to your, your, your condition. We will connect you with the best legal services on earth to get that process going so that we can get you in a position where you are eligible for VA services. So that again is a long answer to a short question, but these, these changes are occurring on a real-time basis. And so this is where we're so blessed to have, I'm looking at Alexis Wachowski now as our press secretary, director of communi communications. We can, she can't do it alone, but together, working with this entire community, uh, we can get this information out there and together we can connect. We can ensure that folks are not suffering in either shame or silence. Uh, I do have a few more questions, but I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Ulrich and then we'll cut him back if they're not answered. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, uh, Commissioner, it's such an important point that you bring up, and it was the focus of a previous hearing of, uh, of the Veterans Committee regarding bad paper, yes. essentially, and, and how many veterans fall through the cracks of. Uh, getting access to mental health and other health care services simply because they have an other than honorable discharge. And uh, I hope that uh, your administration and uh, your team will be working with the team of uh, uh, the, the legal services providers in the city to try to upgrade the ones that are able to be upgraded and, dis and dispute uh, the ones that you think um, can be disputed. Because when, when the veterans are locked out of the VA, uh, there's, as you mentioned, a whole universe of services that are available to them that, that become unavailable to them. And, and we're very thankful that NYU Langone and other uh, private providers are there to help us fill the gap. But if you don't live in a place like New York and you have bad paper, you're, you're kind of out of luck, unfortunately, Absolutely. right? But I, I love this uh, tele-town hall or the, uh, the, the uh, how, how would you describe it? The fact that they can speak to a counselor live stream oh. how, on a oh. webcam, what is that? How do the, they refer oh, the to telemental that? telemental health. Telemental health, Absolutely. I apologize. Yeah, I think that's such a... Gary, do you want to say anything about uh, uh, telemental health in general? Or is it such sure. a great tool. Uh, as with so many things that Commissioner Sons have talked about, these are, uh, and, and which she graciously bracketed within sort of the larger Thrive principles, which we're trying not only to get BVS to absorb as a strategic uh, true north, but, but all of our agencies to absorb. Um, 
you know, they are innovating so many smart approaches that have broader applicability, uh, one of which is telemental health access uh, to care or coaching or other forms of support through, through webs, through smartphones, through other uh, technologies. And uh, we'd like that to be a way that we explode access for all sorts of uh, folks who aren't getting reached, as well, uh, uh, including veterans, but even beyond. I think it's great the more we can use technology to, to reach veterans who are suffering from any form of mental health uh, disorders. Uh, it's just so important, especially around the holidays. It's so sad. It really is so sad. It's, it's sad for people in general because of uh, mental health issues or substance abuse issues that they may have, but uh, especially for veterans this time of year, the more access we can get them, even when they can't get access to the ones that are provided for uh, veterans who are honorably discharged, I think the better. Well, we I would just say, Chair Ulrich, uh, you know, community really is, our bias community re represents the strongest medicine, the front line of intervention, and I just want to recognize the New York City Veterans Alliance. Before uh, the uh, uh, hearing started today, they announced that uh, after this hearing, there's going to be a, a luncheon session for anyone who wants to join, and you know, just in the aftermath of uh, joining together, both public, private, not profit, philanthropic, folks who are, are members of this community and want to be part of making it even stronger. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And that's really, particularly this time of year, it's so important to stay connected. For sure. We have been joined by, I think, almost all the members of the uh, Veterans Committee. I know Councilmember Meisel was here earlier. Uh, was Borelli here? Did he, yes. He was. He checked in. Okay. But Councilmember. He's a winner. He's on both seasons. Well, he gets, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but uh, Councilmember Ballone is here, and he's patiently waiting, and I know he has some questions, so if you will Great. indulge him. I'm Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairs. And Commissioner, let me wish you, your family, and all the veterans of New York City a blessed and happy Thanksgiving, because I know today goes very quickly. Uh, and looking forward, as Chair Cohen also did, who knows what committees we all serve on uh, in a month from now, but it has been an honor to have served with you uh, and the historic changes that the Chairs and we have put together with the veterans looking back probably and uh, going through what we just went through in the last election, this was the number one thing that I was most proud of, seeing the rise of DDS and veterans in the city uh, working with mental health. And Dr. Cole, you are even great at, at acknowledging that. And I think these are the steps that whoever follows in our footsteps has some big shoes to step in because we have raised the bar Yes. in the way it's always been. So thank you for all that. And thank you for getting data for me, hopefully in the spring, because <laughs> no matter where I sit, I will fight to be on this committee. Um, that will be part of what we created even with the veterans ID card. You know, we were trying to just yes. ascertain and make sure that every veteran in the city was accounted for. Big part of my questions, not only here, and I just wanted to give you this one, was with the additional staff, oh, sorry, show the lights on. Uh, with the additional staff, additional staff members, um, where do you envision the next step for DVS? I, I always like to fight for more, especially when budget season's not too far around the corner. I want to see you keep growing, and especially with the relations to interagency action with veterans. I still think there needs to be a lot to be done with the coordination of veterans' efforts and benefits within other agencies, just like we're having a joint hearing today. Absolutely. No, that's an important question, and it's one which throughout the year we pay attention to, particularly in this, these early stages of our agency development, and we're working with uh, City Hall, including OMB, right now to identify what our needs are going forward. Uh, so that we are better um, positioned to do that kind of interagency collaboration and engagement. I know talking with Dr. Belkin, he mentioned that he's hiring somebody on his team who will be able to connect with not only us, DVS, but I mean, this is a priority of this administration, and I think you're going to see in this second term that there will be even a greater, a doubling down of effort to now make this moment in history count, connect the dots, strengthen our ability as a city, the city of New York, God bless you, to, God bless you, to, to be able to um, consolidate the gains of the last four years, particularly everywhere I go. I was, just a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Shulkin convened the first uh, uh, meeting of his new advisory council for uh, family members, survivors, and caregivers. And, you know, he already knew about Thrive NYC. And we started a vibrant conversation talking about the initiative. Which is what happens overhaul, on all, whether it's small business, whether it's aging, whether it's housing, whether it's buildings. 
and now veterans it's have to be every part of that conversation. That, that's that's right. So I think you're going to see more and more of this, and it's something we are acutely uh, interested in and engaged in already. Uh, you'll you'll recall from my testimony, uh, we conducted the mental health first aid training with our uh, our veteran community liaisons. Um, and we'll continue to build on that. But we know that in this, you know, uh, $85 billion or so a year enterprise called the City of New York government, we know that there's not only engagement and collaboration outside uh, the city formally, but within the city so that we can make those taxpayer dollars really, really count and, and be responsive to the needs and strengths of our New Yorkers. Well, Yorkers. I think we have an opportunity with our, our new generation of younger vets. It's a new combat. It's an area that we've been working with, especially with mental health. When I'm out there, whether it's Queens or anywhere else in the city, I still think there's a, a not so much a disconnect, but maybe just not aware mm -hmm. of the difference of DVS today versus the VA in the past, the VA today, DVS today versus MOVA in the past. And I think that's where our challenge is when we deal with our, our partners that are all sitting in the audience. So much of the work that they're doing, we didn't want to replicate and sure. also coordinate and not do one giant website that doesn't include. And <laughs> I think that's part of what we heard in previous hearings was to make sure that the work that they are doing is incorporated into the work you're doing so that a veteran that's returning for their first deployment or several deployments um, knows what's available to him or her immediately and not have to go on this merry-go-round of, okay, now they're in the courts, is there a separate court system? Do I have services, uh, um, housing ability, mental health services? Uh, they age out to aging, what veteran services? I, that they're getting their veterans tax deduction on their property. All of these things come through the heart and mind when you sit with a veteran. Uh, and I think the younger veterans are probably the ones that need really now we can reach out to. So I, I, I look forward to working with that. And I think with staffing too, I think as we go forward, uh, working with the different generations of veterans is an important spot, how we can envision the future of DVS. Well, thank you, Council Member Vallone. I will say as important as it is for us to reach out and embrace the needs and strengths of our younger veterans, they are real, no question about it. Uh, but we also, as you mentioned, we've got to really pay attention across the age span. We know that of the roughly 20 uh, veterans who succumb to dying by suicide on a daily basis, we know that over half of those are actually uh, over the age of 55. And we so know mental health is something that covers So mental all. health is hugely important uh, across the lifespan, and so we need to understand that the, the needs and strengths um, of our uh, post-9-11 generation of veterans, uh, they share some commonalities, but there are some very distinctive uh, age uh, specific needs of our over 50 veterans. And we, as you well know, over 50 is a broad term. We've got uh, Luke Gasperi, who is our, our oldest and longest serving uh, usher at uh, City Field. Those of you who want to meet uh, PFC Gasperi, who was a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge, he mans section. 311 and has not missed a Mets game yet. Everything from PFC Gasperi and his family and all the way. And comes to my fireworks show at Fort Totten every And day. comes to Fort Totten <laughs> all the way to our, you know, our latest 18, 19, 20 year old veteran who's on, you know, R&R &R leave from Germany and is just trying to figure out what's next as they're couch surfing in Queens. So we've got a broad, a broad communications effort and I think you're going to see uh, even more from our team as we build capacity and are able to get the word out. One such, such uh, measure, two months ago, we launched our initial monthly newsletter. If you haven't been getting it, let us know so we can get you on the list. But again, I just have to uh, applaud uh, Alexis and her team, Aquila and our film fellow, um, uh, Melissa, who have just been working across the agency to bring news folks can use out into the mainstream. Now, Alexis, that would be a great idea. Link in every council member. Make Thank sure you. we get them in on two-hour weeks in review, and, and the more we can spread that information. And the last question, Doctor, uh, 
mentioned maybe the new staff that's going to work. Could you elaborate maybe on, on the coordination between the agencies with mental health? So you know the mayor established by executive order the Mental Health Council, and uh, among other things, we want to use that to really um, support other agencies. As you know, most of the Thrive initiatives actually go to other agencies uh, outside of the health department or owned or co-owned by other agencies. And so we really want, that was on purpose, um, uh, but we're trying to, create more liaison support and technical assistance to those agencies. Uh, so that's what the commissioners are referring to. So we really optimize the opportunity that that kind of uh, new part of city government allows us to really pull all agencies in and together around shared goals for mental health. Most people don't realize how many different umbrellas fall under the Department of Health. We're talking about yeah. corrections and records and veterans. It all comes back so much to you. So thank you for your work. Another sure. way of saying that is Mental health is far too important to be left to the psychiatrist. Yeah, I think we need a branch <laughs> just for the council members, which would be great. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much, and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, Dr. Belkin, I have one for you, too. Uh, in, in terms of the nexus between the opioid crisis a, 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 as a veterans issue, could you just talk a little bit about that and what you think is going on in the street? Yeah, that's a great question. It speaks to some of the uh, earlier questions about do we know our denominator, how good is our data, so we can make sure we're reaching people. Um, and I think uh, uh, that speaks, that's especially true in this case. We, the health department uh, funds some very specific veteran-focused naloxone distribution uh, initiatives working through veteran peers, uh, but we still don't have uh, the fullness of information we would like and so that we're aspiring to, uh, to make sure that we're reaching that group. So for example, uh, from the data we have uh, through the medical examiner's office, uh, about 6% uh, of fatal overdoses are uh, veterans, uh, which is about triple, double to triple, uh, the representation of veterans in the New York City population. Um, uh, we think that may be an underreporting, uh, given how that information is sourced. It has to be sought out by families to, to report that. Um, so uh, we really uh, want to make sure that that treatment gap is closed and, and, and that we have the data to know that we're pointing in the right direction. Well, let, let me just say, and speaking you know, as the chair, and, and I mean, we need to do more, I think, on that front, and uh, we need to partner to make sure that we're doing everything we can there because, I mean, you know, I, I represent a council district that, that is, uh, you know, uh, is ravaged by uh, the opioid crisis, and. I have no sense particularly of how the veteran population in my district is impacted by that, but I would like to know and I would like to make sure, again, that we're doing everything we can. Uh, turning, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone on the panel who can particularly answer this, but we, uh, Commissioner, you talked a little bit about uh, veterans' homelessness and the progress that's been made. Um, do we have any actual data on sort of the status of the problem at the moment? How many veterans are in shelter on any given night? How long they stay, that kind of stuff? Sure. It you know, at any given night right now, we're in the 560 today. Uh, so it, um, this contrasts with where we were just a few years ago when we had over 5,000 homeless veterans and several hundred who were on the street. Uh, we are currently in the process of working with our partners on the veterans uh, um, task force as well as our city agency partners so that we can, uh, as you heard in my testimony briefly, we can really more effectively engage both preventive services and aftercare uh, services so that we can reduce the recidivism rate. Currently we have 100 to 120 homeless veterans, new homeless veterans every month. So it remains a work in progress. Um, but that's where we that's where we are right now. We will we will not uh, we will not falter. We will not flag from our efforts to uh, end veteran homelessness. Do you know if veterans tend to stay in shelter for longer or shorter periods of time? Um, so I don't know if I have those uh, specific data. Here we go. So so uh, as I mentioned, we you know country as a whole reduced veteran homelessness by 47 percent the last few years here in New York City, over 90 percent, which is saying a lot, uh, over 72 percent just in these last three years since the mayor took office. But just as importantly, this system that we are building out to rapidly rehouse all new veterans that enter the shelter system, on average, a, an individual who entered the shelter system in New York City 
is homeless for 355 days. For veterans, we've re reduced that to a median of 79 days. Now, let me just comment on this briefly because uh, this has become all the more apparent to me as we've been able to stand up this new agency. It's long been my abiding conviction that we can take on the city's most vexing challenges, and certainly homelessness is one. And by building and designing these systems that work well for veterans and their loved ones, has the benefit of bringing together all elements of the p political spectrum. Everyone wants to be part of this. But we're then in a position to be able to apply, to scale, to replicate the innovations that we've learned in working with veterans and their loved ones to the broader population. It's another way that veterans can continue to serve. There have been three such innovations thus far in our homelessness campaign. One is our team of veteran peer coordinators. You know, we looked at the system. We saw there were lots of landlords. We had case uh, managers, we had housing managers, all kinds of folks, but where were the peer-to-peer -peer folks working with our veterans? Their only job is to work with that veteran, get them to the interview, get them buffed up, pat them in the back, kick them in the rear, do the th all the things that peer-to-peers do with coordinating veterans' uh, care. The city looked over our shoulders and saw this innovation and said, you know, just like Dr. Falcon did a few years ago, this isn't just a veteran strength. This is a human strength and is now starting to scale that innovation more broadly with peer coordinators. Second innovation is our landlord hotline. We set up a landlord hotline where landlords across the city can call DVS today, get a live person on the other end who will then bust through the bureaucracy and get that veteran into an apartment. And not, not just any veteran, but get the right veteran, get the right fit. And so that is now a, a, an innovation that is being uh, adopted more broadly. And thirdly, uh, the Home Tracker, which is a by name list of all of the homeless population here in New York City, it was innovated through the Veteran Home Tracker. So as, it's just a quick uh, uh, example of how our most mature line of action, housing and sports services, were already able to scale and replicate those innovations. We're on the road with whole health as well as uh, our um, uh, business engagement and our work through Rikers and the criminal justice system. Again, this is a follow-up, and again, maybe someone from HPD might be better situated to answer this, but in terms of veterans leaving shelter uh, versus, you know, support, like, you know, one of the things I've learned, some people are homeless simply for economics, and some people are homeless for a variety of other social issues that they face. Uh, in terms of the veterans population, how many veterans do you, if we know, leave shelter for supportive housing specific for veterans or supportive housing in general versus? We, uh, we've identified this as an area where we are currently working to increase access to supportive housing for our veterans. We know that currently about 5% of our veterans uh, access supportive housing coming out of shelter. About 50% of them would be eligible, but let me make this clear. It's both a supply concern, and we're working with DOHMH and other partners to, to be able to address that. It's also a demand issue for all too many, and some of you folks here can help us, so all too many of our veterans, there's a stigma attached to supportive housing that we need to break through. So one of the things that we're doing is we're just last week or two weeks ago, we had a, an event at uh, Border or Borden Avenue Shelter where we brought in veterans who have successfully made the move to supportive housing, they're flourishing and they're now telling the story to their buds who are back in the shelter. So we'll continue down this road, but you're exactly right. One way to, to reduce that recidivism is to make sure that we get veterans into the right settings with the right services to begin with. I do just want to acknowledge the administration recently reaffirmed its commitment. I have a supportive housing for veterans facility coming to the North uh, West Bronx at the Muller Center in the Bronx. So yes, I'm looking forward to. We'll, maybe we'll go to we'll, ribbon, we'll great, go to ribbon cutting we'll together. Have a great that will celebration. be great celebration. Absolutely, that will be great. Uh, I I just have one last question on uh, the courts. And again, do we have sort of data on uh, how many vets are taking advantage uh, of these designated courts? Um, and do we think that they're uh, that, that they're getting the veterans are getting treated in a way that's keeping them. Uh, from having further contact with the courts. So the first phase in this journey was to get a veteran treatment court in each borough. We now have that. 
uh, Eric Henry is in the process of engaging with each. Eric Henry is our uh, senior, our, our um, legal counsel, as well as our director of intergovernmental affairs. So I don't have an answer for you on that right now, other than that we are in the process of engaging with each veteran treatment court leader. Uh, and I just, uh, in Staten Island, just uh, last a week ago, uh, talked with the folks from Brooklyn and uh, Everyone that we engage with, regardless the borough, recognizes that now our challenge is to identify what are the best practices with respect to mental health care as well as a range of other issues to include what kinds of offenses are render veterans actually eligible. And I will tell you just a, a quick snapshot from uh, Maybe a month ago, there was a New York Times article that talked about a command sergeant major who was in Portland, Oregon, and who had a, an episode in a restaurant, uh, turns out, owned by an Iraqi family, and uh, just, you know, had been seeking mental health care, hadn't gotten it, and because of that one episode where he lashed out and, and, and uh, you know, threw a chair and uh, was arrested, he's now lost uh, his rank. He's now in jail, and his behavior can absolutely be tied to the character and the content of his service over these last 16 years. So we've got to get better at this, not just in New York, but we can be a voice across the nation. More recently, last week, there was another New York Times article that came from a uh, New York Times the Magazine article earlier this year where a judge in Illinois saw what had happened for this veteran who had ended up in prison with a six-year sentence, characterized the, the love affair with his girlfriend who he then became uh, engaged to, and the judge actually reached out to, got him out of prison, married them, and in fact, when he had difficulty getting a job because he was an able-bodied but yet a uh, felon on probation, he was unable to get anyone to look upon his uh, capabilities positively. This judge linked him up with the uh, trades union and uh, he's now on his way. But we, we, you know, it's nice to know that this happened in this situation, but how many other veterans are out there languishing because of their experience within this, the criminal justice system? So we have a lot of work to do. Fortunately, we've got some great legal service providers here in New York City and uh, you'll hear more about this going forward, but we are we are absolutely in agreement with you. This is critical. Uh, I want to thank you for answering my questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Ulrich, but I did want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Mental Health Committee uh, member uh, Barry Grudenchik. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you again, uh, Chair Cohen. Uh, what a, you know, we could spend hours, literally, and I know this is a passion for you in particular, uh, Commissioner. We could spend hours talking about this subject, but we don't have hours, obviously. But uh, before I want to go, uh, before I want to let you go and call up the next panel, <clears throat> again, I just want to uh, restate um, my respect and admiration for the job that you and your team have done building up this agency from nothing, or next to nothing almost. And um, when I walked in the room, actually the first hearing that we had uh, about four years ago, uh, Veterans Committee, there were about five people in the back of the room. The room was empty. I, I didn't even know if this was the right room. And, and to walk in here now and to see so many people listening intently. Nobody's on their Blackberries or, or iPhones. They're really, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're engaged in the conversation and they're taking back what they're hearing and they're thinking about questions and ways to improve things. And you brought up the um, <coughs> interdisciplinary application of uh, uh, methods that are successful. You brought up the Veterans Treatment Court. We fought very hard. We, the council, the mayor's office, to make sure that we established it in each borough uh, because we know how effective it has been. And, and there are now studies going on, which I think you're aware of, that show how successful the mentor, uh, mentor aspect of the Veterans Treatment Court uh, is in reducing the recidivism rate and, uh, and how that can be applied to other treatment courts, mental health court, drug court, you know, family court, other specialty courts. Uh, but up until recently, we didn't have the Veterans Treatment Court in all five boroughs. And something else that you brought up, which is very important, is that what type of offenses can be brought uh, require the consent of the local district attorney. And so hopefully the state, the Office of Court Administration, can look into that because I think there needs to be a uniform standard. We have one 
New York City, New York City criminal court system yes. and is divided by five boroughs because of how the court system is set up, but we have one criminal court system and how criminal court judges are appointed and put on the bench is uniform, but what type of offenses can be brought in each borough varies depending on where you live. Certain felonies in the Bronx happens to be, uh, Bronx and Brooklyn happen to be, I don't want to use the word liberal, but uh, happen to be the most lenient in terms of what type of offenses they allow in the uh, VTCs. Uh, but Staten Island and uh, Manhattan are not so uh, open to all the same type of offenses. And so essentially if you're a veteran who is arrested for a particular type of crime, it depends on where you live or where that, where that crime allegedly was committed whether or not you will be granted access to VTCs. Well, and you know, you know one it, part of it's it is- It's a disparity, is, it's a disparity. It's a disparity, and I right. think it can be tied perhaps to the developmental cycle of our veteran treatment courts, because as you know, Manhattan and Staten Island are were new. the last two to come on board. They are new. So uh, we, we will be working with them. We're also very blessed to have Judge uh, Russell just up oh, the yeah. uh, road in Buffalo, yeah. who's the granddaddy of veteran treatment courts. I just have some late-breaking data from Eric, uh, who informs me here that of the total 239 veterans who to date have gone through the veteran treatment courts, the five New York City veteran treatment courts, 214 have successfully graduated. Wonderful. This is a 90% success rate, So, and we will build on this, so more to follow. Well, whatever we're doing in the VTCs, it's working, and we need to, as you suggested, share best practices and help other people on the road to recovery and, and divert them from Rikers Island and from upstate and other places where they're, they're really not going to get the help that they need. That's just... Like I said, we can go on for hours, but I want to thank you again. You have done such an extraordinary job, you and your uh, administration, and I tip my hat to you that the substance, the facts, the, the initiative, the passion that you bring to this job is second to none, and uh, you know, the mayor could not have picked a better person, and I, I don't know that you need to be reappointed, right, if in a second term, but I, I hope if there is a reappointment that happens. That, I'll just that keep showing up. I'm going to exactly. keep on marching, <laughs> Chair Ulrich. I hope. <laughs> but I would just say when it comes to the health and well-being of our veterans, our service members, and their loved ones, for any of us who are here in this room today, and that includes every one yeah. of you on the committees, this is not an academic issue. It's not a theoretical or abstract issue. This is life and death. These are our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles, our fathers, our mothers, and yeah. so we will keep on marching. This is truly sacred work, work worth doing. So thank you all. Thank, thank you for God doing bless. the Lord's work, and happy Thanksgiving to you thank and your you families. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. We're going to call up the first panel. We are going to run the clock uh, for three minutes for each person's testimony. I am not very, very strict with it, but I will ask that you do your absolute best to stay within the time frame. So if you go a little bit over, it's okay. If you fall short, you can yield the remainder of your time. It's like Congress. Okay. So the first, uh, the first panel, Lana Duffy, New York City Veterans Alliance, Olivia Meyer, New York City Veterans Alliance, Corey Ortega, New York City Veterans Alliance, and Molly Pearl. New York City Veterans Alliance, okay. And we have three other panels. Okay, so why don't we start on the left and work our way to the right, and the next time we'll start on the right and work our way to the left. I had an order. Oh, you did? Oh, well then, <laughs> who, am I, who am I to disrupt or create this order? But uh, <laughs> at your, <laughs> that was a hearty laugh post-election day. Anyway, so uh, at your leisure and wh whomever wants to start first, that's fine. There we go. Huh, how you doing? Uh, good morning, and thank you, Chairs Ulrich and Cohen, for the opportunity to testify today. 
My name is Corey Ortega. I'm the Director of Civic and Government Affairs for the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member-driven grassroots policy advocacy and community building organization that advances veterans and families as civic leaders in New York City and beyond. <clears throat> I'm presenting testimony on behalf of our members who are active stakeholders in our advocacy. We're providing a packet of testimonies and supporting materials for you today that includes results of a quick online survey of our membership that we conducted last week in preparation for this hearing. I would like to highlight <coughs> the input we received from our members in our testimony today, as well as other key issues the New York City Veterans Alliance would like to bring to the attention of both committees as our city government works to improve mental health services for New York City's more than 210,000 veterans. Our recommendations are as follows. <coughs> New York City Council should support funding and detailed oversight for coordination and outreach of mental health and suicide prevention services for veterans. Access to mental health and suicide prevention services have consistently been among the topmost concerns of our membership and the national statistic of 20 veterans each day committing suicide has touched us here in New York City as well. New York City Veterans Alliance member feedback. In our online survey, our members <coughs> most whom are veterans, rated the overall availability of affordable, effective programs to address mental health and suicide prevention for New York City veterans as 3.3 out of 5. While members acknowledge that the mental health resources are generally available, they've noted problems with outreach, long-term care, lack of coordination with New York City's health and hospital system, and support for veterans who are both navigating mental health care needs while also contending with often arduous VA disability claims process. New York serves. New York serves as a network hub for more than dozens of organizations providing services to veterans and families. And the New York City Veterans Alliance is in the onboarding process so we can make better, so we can better connect and track the referrals that we are making, as well as accepting referrals of veterans and family members for our civic, for our civic leadership program. The majority of Alliance members we surveyed cannot state conclusively whether New York serves is effective for our community or not, with equal members stating that they do not know, uh, that they do know it is effective as those stating that it is not effective. With DVS budgeting approximately 800000 for the acquisition and development of New York serves under the name Vet Connect NYC, we recommend that New York City Council strive to capture data on the quality and timeliness of referrals and follow-ups provided by this service. We further recommend that DVS be assigned a dedicated contractor. Oh, wow. Uh, may I ask for a minute more? Thank you kindly. Um, now, where was I? Uh, here we go. We further recommend that DVS be assigned a dedicated contracting officer to facilitate city acquisition of New York serves without further delays. DVS outreach. Since July, to, since July 2016, the Mayor's Office of Veteran Affairs now DVS has received funding for outreach specialists to connect veterans and family members with benefits and services for which they are eligible in New York City government, New York State government, the VA, and available through nonprofits and VSOs locally. Although more of our members were familiar with the outreach specialists that DVS provides than they, are, uh, than they were with New York serves, our members nevertheless remain split or uncertain of their effectiveness. We are concerned that the individuals served over the last 17 months have not been as adequately tracked or possibly turned away based on the anecdotes we've heard. Um, it is worth noting that one of our members responded in our survey last week that he is still waiting over a month for follow-up from DVS. But because of that concern, I met with Eric Henry, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, and Leticia, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Rasa? Close enough. Okay, no correction, so I'm right. Um, senior veteran liaison and community specialist from DVS last week. I was encouraged that DVS has secured an in-house customer relation management system to track individuals who have contacted DVS and the nature and effectiveness of their referrals. We recommend that DVS notify the Veterans Committee when the system is fully operational to address this concern. Uh, we'll also connect uh, our member with DVS to make sure that follow-up uh, is executed. I am almost done. Uh, New York City must fulfill its commitment as, caregiver as a caregiver-friendly city. Last year, New York City passed a resolution on its commitment as a hidden hero city, prioritizing recognition and support for the caregivers of military members and veterans. It is crucial 
for those who give daily care and support to veterans and service members to have all the support they need. And we urge New York City Council and the committees on veterans and health to include caregivers in all discussion of veterans' mental health and overall wellness. Uh, in our online survey, our members rated the availability of affordable, effective programs for caregivers as 2.5 out of 5, which is lower than the rated mental health programs for veterans. Uh, I will refer uh, to you, I will refer you to Molly Pearl's testimony and further recommendations. And here I'm closing. Uh, in the economy time, I would like to point, I would like to point, uh, point you to written testimony which highlights New York City must leverage its resources uh, for veteran, uh, veterans and caregivers, specifically DVS Whole Health and Community Resilience Initiative, DVS Public Artists and Residents Investment, and 311 referrals for veteran crisis. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Pending your question, this concludes my testimony. Well, well I have a few questions, but we'll save it until everybody has um, finished uh, delivering their remarks. And then just so you know, too, that I know that there was uh, about a page that you couldn't get to. Uh, it does get entered into the record, and I did read it, so uh, just so you know. But in the interest of time, because we have several other panels as well. Uh, so Molly is next, I think, right? Yes. Okay, thank great. You. All right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to Chairs Ulrich and Cohen and committee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Molly Pearl. I serve as the Executive Secretary of the Board for New York City Veterans Alliance, and I am the spouse and caregiver of a veteran. I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Alliance about the availability of comprehensive, accessible, and affordable services for military and veteran caregivers, an essential component in ensuring the whole health of the veterans community here in New York. In September of last year, New York City passed a resolution in support of military and veteran caregivers, making it the 50th Hidden Hero City recognized by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Since passage of that resolution, DVS held one film screening with approximately 60 veterans, service members, and caregivers in the audience. While the resolution and film screening show intent and effort, we still have a long way to go towards demonstrating true acknowledgement and support for caregivers. This committee knows that barriers to entry, stigma, and ill-equipped providers can make the difference between a veteran seeking services or retreating deeper into mental health crisis. These facts hold true for caregivers as well. We also know that an empowered and supported caregiver is often a lifeline and the greatest ally in a veteran's wellness journey. Although we've made great strides in addressing accessibility <clears throat> and quality of services for vets, we have not extended those same services to caregivers. I want to stress that although I am a licensed social worker and have access to an extensive personal and professional network, I still faced significant challenges when I sought mental health and peer support during the most intensive phases of my own caregiving journey. I urge you to read my full testimony included in the provided packet detailing the issues that I faced. We know that there are five and a half million military and veteran caregivers in the US, but we have not seen data from New York City government on the number that live here or what their specific needs are. We also know that 40% of post 9-11 caregivers in the U.S. meet criteria for probable major depressive disorder and that 43% report experience anxiety. Yet there are few organizations providing affordable, timely, or accessible services for caregivers, a population that struggles with unemployment, emotional strain, and who rarely have time for themselves. It is also important to note that the stipend associated with the VA caregiver program is only offered to caregivers of post 9-11 veterans neglecting those who care for vets suffering with persistent service-connected conditions like Agent Orange and Gulf War Syndrome. If we are truly committed to recognizing and supporting military caregivers, we need the whole of New York City government, from DBS to NYC Health and Hospitals to the Department of Social Services, to ensure that their screening tools identify caregivers, that data is captured to assess their support and well-being, and outreach and programs are offered to meet their real-life schedules and needs. Just last week, I attended the Elizabeth Dole Foundation's national convening and heard about the work being done in Monterey, California. They recently launched Students for Heroes, which matches high school students, I've got one more sentence, uh, which matches high school students with caregivers to help them with daily tasks and emotional support. I urge us to learn from the great work being done in other hidden hero cities. New York must look beyond film screenings and performances to ask what robust, effective, and measurable services can be offered to truly recognize and support the caregivers of our city's more than 210,000 veterans. 
Caregivers are our strongest allies, our most reliable support, and our greatest influence when it comes to improving wellness outcomes for veterans. Caregivers are part of this community. I am part of this community, and we desperately need to be recognized and supported. On behalf of New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and pending any questions, that ends my testimony. Thank you. Uh, and who is next? I am next. Okay. All right. uh, good afternoon. And thank you to Chairs Ulrich and Cohen for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Livia Meyer, and I am the Director of Operations and Development for the New York City Veterans Alliance. I'd like to begin my testimony by thanking members of the Council for passing Local Law 119, which went into effect over the weekend as the most comprehensive local protection in the nation for veterans and service members. We are proud to have proposed and advocated for this important legislation, and we are grateful for the leadership of Public Advocate Letitia James, Council Member Jumani Williams and the Committees on Veterans and Civil Rights, as well as Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito. Discrimination increases, exacerbates, and prolongs overall stress and can have a negative effect on one's mental and physical health. Having local recourse for discrimination in housing, employment, lending, and public accommodations will have tangible results in reducing stress for veteran service members and their families, not only improving overall health outcomes, but also making them feel more accepted and appreciated in the city and they live in. Another important measure towards improving overall mental health outcomes for our community is improving outreach and access to services through NYC Veterans Alliance's Community Outreach Program. We believe that wellness begins with building community bonds with veterans, families, and civilian allies through service projects, celebrations, and commemorative events, artistic and performance workshops, and other vital social activities. The New York City Veterans Alliance is committed to publicizing these events and resources online through our rveterans.nyc community calendar where we have to date posted more than 1,800 separate events for veterans and families across the New York, C New York City metropolitan area. Our veterans.nyc is currently the only online calendar of its kind in the country, and we can, are continuing to engage our growing, growing audience as a consistent, reliable source of information for veterans and families. In the 14 months since we began our veterans.nyc, the website is now averaging more than 7,000 page views per month by an estimated 5,600 return. 5,600 returning users over the last two months. Our outreach also fe features a weekly email newsletter to further promote events and resources, which we now distribute to more than 8,500 subscribers. We are going on our 110th issue of our weekly newsletter, and we're finding that the demand for information is only increasing. We promote events and resources on our social media channels, where we have the largest following of any NYC-specific veterans organization. This important outreach has thus far been funded by our generous donors uh, from our membership board and individual donors. We hope to further discuss potential funding from NYC government to help us continue expanding this vital resource for improving outreach and access to services, resources, and opportunities for NYC veterans and families. To further improve access and to build trust in the resources available, we recommend Pathfinder.vet, a tech startup that has created a platform for our community to rate the quality, and services, uh, the quality of services and opportunities offered by governmental and private organizations. Growth of this platform is vital. Veterans and ca caregivers should be able to trust in the reliability of ratings by our community in a way similar to how a platform like Yelp lets them see the best bagel place or restaurant in their neighborhood. Alana Duffy will discuss Pathfinder in her testimony. To further incre increase access to resources, we also recommend to both committees support for intro 80, 850, I, I'm sorry, 855A, introduced by Council Member Ben Kalos, which proposes to improve and streamline access to services for New Yorkers seeking help with the Department of Social Services by, by mandating automatic referrals to other government services and benefits which they are eligible. Uh, vulnerable New Yorkers, which includes veterans, caregivers, and family members, will be helped by ease of access to information about food assistance, housing programs, and mental health services, that can, and that can reduce stress and improve the opportunities and quality of life. Outcomes in mental health are improved by reducing stressors and increasing access and trust in vital services and resources offered in our community. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony. Okay, thank you. And again, I have a few questions, but I'm going to save it. And I think Ms. Duffy is the, uh, the last one to testify on the panel, on this panel. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Alana Duffy, and I am a veteran entrepreneur and CEO of Pathfinder Labs, as well as on the advisory council of the New York City Veterans Alliance. And it should be noted that I am also affiliated with the Core 4 Steering Committee and, and several other 
uh, programs in this room. As an Army combat veteran and a Purple Heart recipient, please allow me to say thank you, Chairman Ulrich, Chairman Cohen, and committee members for your service to our community and your commitment to improving veteran lives. I once struggled searching for mental health services for veterans, but in my years of working with a number of organizations in New York City and as the founder of a tech company, I have gained valuable insights on how both government and private sectors can support veteran reintegration and access to services, not only with digital and in-person connectivity, but also by building systems of community-driven quality control. There still remains an unfortunate lack of oversight within the veteran services system, making accessibility, trust, and quality control a challenge for users. I would like to offer testimony on how this mission stunts veteran mental, mental health and reintegration. When I created Pathfinder.vet two years ago, I wanted to give veterans an online platform where they could rate services and organizations, write reviews, and learn for themselves which resources they should be turning to for help and opportunities. While in market testing, Pathfinder grew as a ratings platform with roughly 500 reviews, increasing daily of over 170 organizations nationwide. Our 450 test users are able to sort by geographic location to find organizational resources near them. What we found is these ratings and reviews help provide information on community services impact, give feedback to supporting services and municipalities, and are a guiding tool to let veteran service members, families, and caregivers connect with local resources quickly and easily. Like other, ratings plat like other ratings platforms, such as Yelp, Pathfinder has the increased capability to provide organizational oversight through community-driven quality control and advanced analytics. We demonstrate and give providers the chance to respond to and improve upon, which is important, impact as assessed by the community. As an example of even the basic level of contribution, we recently asked our audience to focus on ratings of arts-related programs. A veteran attends productions, for example, by, by Theater of War, uh, currently rated at 1.7 stars, Aquila Theater, 4.3 stars, and Arts in the Armed Forces at 4.5 stars, and reviews each of them, providing valuable information. Future attendees know what to expect while a partner city agency, like DVS, receives comparative data and statistical analysis defining resource impact and usage. Providers also receive imp improvement suggestions. In this assessment scenario, Theater of War might consider, for example, hiring veteran performers through a partnership with a better rated program. Impact, pro impact feedback provides dynamic, cyclic, and community-wide improvements in, a service in services affecting mental health and stability. Uh, just to conclude, the rest of it being in my testimony, I do hope that this uh, commi committee and city council can assist in facilitating partnerships between local and independent and unbiased sourcing to provide a better, dynamic, personal, and relevant tool to improve every aspect of our great community. This concludes my testimony, pending any questions. Of course. Well, thank you for your testimony, and also thank you for your service. and. Uh, uh, Councilman Ballone normally beats me to the punch, but I think he had to step out. Is he still here? <laughs> he left. Okay. But I want to thank all the veterans that are in the room today and all those that are watching um, online. Thank them for their service. And you, you continue to serve. It's not like you, you did something a long time ago and then you just, you know, put the uniform in the closet and forgot all about it. Here you are taking time out of your very busy schedules on a weekday to come testify before the city council to advocate for your fellow comrades and um, and other service members who in some cases can't even speak up for themselves you know so I think that's very very admirable and uh, I want to thank you for your service so I have a few questions first um, let's go back to Corey's testimony because I was listening and um, looking for where I made a note here Care, you spoke about caregiver-friendly city. I think you and Molly also uh, touched on caregiver-friendly um, policies and such. I'm just I'm, I'm thinking out loud. I think one of the big problems there is funding and is money to actually pay for not only caregivers but support for caregivers and, and their extended network. And as you pointed out, or I think Molly might have pointed out, the post-9-11 vets, there's more funding for it. 
people who are Vietnam era veterans who still suffer from uh, PTSD or some other service have some other service connected disability that affects their mental health you know that there's really a dry well and I think this is probably an area for a nonprofit or a public private partnership to emerge I think you've identified something you, you, you found a gap you know where people are falling through the cracks and then how we as a city as, as a government and as advocates can work with a nonprofit group or identify a nonprofit group that can expand services to that catchment. I also remember the committee took a tour of, um, of the NYU, NYU Langone Center, and I'm sure that someone is here representing them uh, today. Yes, okay. Um, we had a fantastic tour, and I'll be asking them a couple of questions because I think that they were providing uh, mental health counseling and services for veterans and their families uh, uh, for extended periods of time, but it, there was no indefinite commitment, I think, because of funding and other constraints that people have. So, you know, again, where, where do we fill that gap? And if you have any ideas for how we can do that or how many people you might think are affected by that or could benefit from that, I'm, I'm all ears. So we don't, we don't pretend to have all of the answers and solutions. We actually look to the advocates who deal with people in the field to, to bring us back that, that feedback and provide us with that information. So if you can think of a model that is sustainable or a, a system that we can set up, or even a pilot program that the administration and the council can look at implementing in the upcoming fiscal year, we're approaching the budget season, and we always look for interesting, dynamic ways. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it's fine. At least we tried something. But I think the caregiver aspect is really, really important, and, um, you know, but I don't think that the government is in a position to necessarily solve or address this independently and in a way that is going to meet all those needs. I think that this is an area where a public-private partnership would probably work best. So that, that's just my, you can add to that if you want. I absolutely agree. I think the only way forward is, is through partnership. Um, and I think part of where we can start that is looking at what services are currently available. And I think that involves not only looking at services that are available right now for caregivers, NYU Langone is fantastic. Um, yeah. That's where my husband got his mental health treatment to start before he went to someone with Soldiers Project. Um, Headstrong Project, for instance, has uh, a caregiver support group, which I've heard nothing but amazing feedback about. Um, but when we look at those resources, we also have to look at what aspects of them are not working. So NYU, for instance, offers uh, a time. Uh, there, there's only yeah time limited. Uh, counseling. So if you're in more of a long-term dredging through it kind of caregiving situation Correct. like I am, you have to look for someone long, long-term. long Or for instance, Headstrong, I actually can't go to their caregiver support group because it's only available to uh, caregivers whose veterans are enrolled in their programming. Yeah. Um, so we just, we, there are services that exist. It's an issue of barrier to entry. And then I think it's also an issue of looking at all of these amazing mental health resources that we have in New York City and saying, what does it mean for you to make these available to caregivers? Is that actually a priority for you? How do we help you um, make that available? And when it comes to actually connecting that to caregivers, I think it's entirely about um, saying it as frequently and clearly and openly as possible yeah. because caregivers are really busy and they need to hear it that many times. Chair. Yeah, I, I just want to echo the comments that Chair Ulrich made because uh, as the chair of the Mental Health Committee, um, there are, literally, there are literally millions of dollars that go through initiative funding, and we've had a particular focus on sort of wraparound services, services that are not as easily uh, quantifiable in terms of you know, getting a strict measurement of, of the results, but obviously if, you know, if a family member has uh, post-traumatic stress, the family is impacted. It's not, right. it's not a standalone thing, there's no, uh, you know, a way to contain it. It, it permeates the entire family. Uh, and providing wraparound services, I find, I think that the council is uniquely situated to be of assistance in those kind of, uh, in those kind of areas, providing secondary services and support services. So uh, I would just echo what uh, Chair Ulrich said in terms of uh, if there is an idea, a thought, a niche that, that the council could step into, we could uh, to do that in a way that I think is effective. Several months ago, I had a conversation with uh, Doctors Council, SEIU. It's the union which represents the city's 
uh, physicians and city hospitals, among other um, members that they have in other healthcare networks. And I asked them, if I mentioned to them that I chair the Veterans Committee, and I, and I mentioned uh, to them, and I asked them what type of uh, targeted services they provide for veterans at, at city hospitals.